Welcome. We're glad you showed up. I mean, what a beautiful day in Southern California today. I mean, I thought the winds were howling at 5 o'clock this morning when I jumped in the pool and I said, oh my God, everybody's going to be blown away. And yet the sun came up and it's turned into a gorgeous, gorgeous day. So thank you for coming. 13th uh, Summit and wow, time goes by fast. Well, I'm sure many of you have heard the phrase, we live in interesting times. You know, when you think of that phrase, it's kind of a euphemism for we live in troubling times, chaotic times, unsettling times. And when you look around the globe today, all those words kind of relate to what's happening. We're having a war in Europe for the first time in decades. We have political strife with the biggest other country in the world in China. Tensions are rising in Asia. We have more political strife in our country, largely fueled by the media and social media, than we've ever seen for, again, long stretches of time. You could have to go back to the 20s or maybe even to the Civil War. And then you have the Western world with deep, underlying, big economic problems. So my goal today is to give you a lot of information, to share as much data and information I can possibly do in you know, the time allocated, that when you walk out of here, you will know how to position yourself for these coming storms, this rough sea that this country and the globe is going through. Now, don't blame the messenger. Please don't throw tomatoes at me if you don't like what you're hearing. But again, I really do want to kind of walk you through in a very honest assessment of what's unfolding. So let's get going. I unfortunately cannot start without mentioning, all right, let's go. Oh, before I get into that, I have to do last year's predictions. I have to walk through what I predicted. Now, some years, you don't want to get up here and talk about your past predictions because you just get them all wrong. <laughs> Most years, you know, you get some right, some wrong. This past year, I hate to say it, but man, I really nailed it. <laughs> I, uh, I broke them down in predictions that hit the bullseye, predictions that hit the board, the dartboard, and predictions that missed the board. So what did I predict? I said headwinds in the equity markets would cause a market correction. The three major US equities have all suffered losses more than 20% at some point during this year. Uh, the only one that's not in a bear market is the Dow, given its rally that it's just had in the last few weeks. I predicted that the bubble in meme stocks and cryptocurrencies would pop. Pop, they did. I predicted inflation would be structural, not transitory. Well, inflation has persisted, grinded higher, and even the Fed has acknowledged it's not transitory. I predicted unemployment rate would decline. Employers have struggled to find qualified candidates. The unemployment rate has continued to decline, and the labor markets uh, remain tight. Political predictions that hit the bullseye, I nailed every single one of them. I'm not going to spend my time because I've got a lot to cover, but you know, Bill Black better did not get done, Senator Manchin got his way, no major tax changes uh, occurred. They did pass what I said, the global minimum tax of 15%, but no change in cap gains rates. Series of green energy policies, but as I said, you can take a look at that at your leisure. Predictions that were on the board. I said commercial real estate, but for office uh, values would remain strong and capitalization rates low. Largely, that has been the case throughout most of the year, but now cap rates are starting to rise and asset values starting to weaken. I predicted GDP growth would slow, remain positive in the first half of the year, but risk of recession in the second half. Well, GDP growth slowed and then turned slightly negative for the first two quarters, followed by a positive print in, of 2.6 in this most recent quarter. So my timing was a bit off. I said short-term rates would remain anchored at zero for one, uh, the first quarter and stay low in the summer. 
The Fed stayed low in the first quarter, made their first 25 basis point rate move at the end of March, and then started their more meaningful moves in May. And I said housing prices would stall and home values would crack 5 to 10%. I still think that's going to happen. But uh, medium home prices continue to grind up through the early part of 2022, and now are starting to contract. And the one that was off the board entirely was uh, I predicted that the 10-year Treasury yield would swing between 1.3 and 2 and a quarter. Well, as the Fed started really hiking rates, the 10-year Treasury grinded higher. It's been bouncing around to the high threes. And to, uh, this morning, it's at 417. So all in all, a pretty darn good uh, set of predictions. Now the, the problem is how do you match that this coming year? Well, let's get on with the presentation. What I was going to say before I had to go back to these predictions was I can't start this presentation without mentioning COVID. I really look forward, and next year I will not mention it all, but you can't discuss the economic issues and what we're facing without mentioning COVID. Obviously, this is a graph of both uh, weekly cases, which is the red. Uh, the black line is weekly deaths. Clearly, uh, we had a massive spike at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. Almost everybody I know between November or Thanksgiving and uh, the early part of the year ended up getting COVID. I got it for my second time. Fortunately, the death rate continues to decline, which is normal for viruses as they pass uh, and mutate. They become less deadly. Obviously, the vaccine has had an effect on the, the symptoms and most importantly, most everybody's got natural immunity. But the one thing that did come from, and I won't even call it COVID, I'll call it the lockdowns, it really was a public health disaster. And the results are coming in on that. Suicide rates for our young people have skyrocketed. Drug abuse, addictions, overdoses. We were coming down with the opiate problem before COVID, and now, boom. We're losing 100,000 largely young people a year to fentanyl and opiates. Mental health issues, misdiagnosed or late diagnosis of cancer. Across the board, the lockdowns ended up being a public health disaster. And the one thing that is so clearly the case, because study after study has come out, is what it did to our kids. Not only did we deprive our young people of a lot of coming of age moments, think of it, prom, homecoming, graduation, sports, all these things, but their education performance has collapsed. They've done multiple, multiple studies, and it's stunning at what's happened to reading rates and math rates and everything else. So I feel sad for our kids, and I hope at some point we look as a country honestly back at the decisions that were made, not to so much blame people, but to make an assessment so we don't make the same mistakes again in the future. Because it was kind of absurd that we were ever going to stop a virus by locking people in. So with that being said, let's get on to the economic side of it and the consequences of the lockdowns as well. Well, the stimulus party ran up one hell of a tab. Obviously, during the lockdowns, uh, we passed a whole series of spending initiatives, the CARES Act. I'm not even going to run through them all. We spent $3.5 trillion. Now, to put that in perspective, when we were in the Great Financial Recession, we spent $767 billion. And that was a much deeper structural problem. But then, even after we were coming out, and the economy was already booming back, President Biden and the Democrats took over. They spent one, another $1.9 trillion and another $550 billion in the infrastructure bill, then $280 billion in the CHIPS Act, and then the best one of all is the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, I don't know how the heck spending more money is in reducing inflation because the definition of inflation is too much money chasing a fixed amount of goods. So now we're going to spend another $437 billion and say we're going to reduce inflation with that. It's a little kooky. But we ended up spending another $3.2 trillion. 
So in total, $6.7 trillion. That's almost 10 times what we spent during the Great Financial Recession. A stunning amount of money. Well, now the party's over. The spending binge is coming to an end. I want to show you this graph because it's one of those that you just look at and go, how could this be? We racked up $7 trillion in debt. Our GDP of our economy today is $25 trillion. We have spent more money in two and a half years or added more debt to the federal government's balance sheet than we did in the first 215 years of our country's history. Let that sink in. Now, don't get me wrong. Ever since the Great Financial Recession, we've been spending money like mad. You know, President Obama, President Trump, President Biden. So we have gotten ourselves in a massive economic problem with all the spending we've done. But what we did in two and a half years is remarkable. But not only did we do all the spending, what happened is the Federal Reserve massively increased its balance sheet. What you're looking at, and by the way, folks, when you see these gray bar graphs, those all indicate recession. And you're going to see them on every slide when we go into recession. So this is the Federal Reserve balance sheet. If you look at it, the dark blue blackish is the holding of US Treasuries by the Fed. And the red is holding of mortgage-backed securities. So what the Fed did uh, when, during the Great Financial Recession, they started something called quantitative easing and massively increased their balance sheet, injecting money into the system. And they did it in two rounds, first uh, during the heart of the Great Financial Recession, and then a second round around 2012 to try to pump up the economy. Then in 2018, they started bringing down their balance sheet, trying to run off some of it. They couldn't get too far before equity markets started falling apart. Then COVID came, boom. They expanded their balance sheet by $4.8 trillion. They flooded our capital markets and economy with money. And I'll get into how they do that as a refresher course on how quantitative easing works in just a bit. Well, the bill for the party has arrived, and unfortunately, it's called inflation. Too much money chasing a fixed amount of goods. Well, let's look at inflation. So the first graph is uh, CPI, Consumer Price Index. The second graph is PPI, Producer Price Index. As you will see, this is the 1980s, the very beginning of the 1980s when Paul Volcker had to take interest rates incredibly high to break inflation because we were spending too much money and printing too much money in the 60s and 70s. Then we had 40 years of falling inflation, 40 years of falling interest rates, and now, boom, inflation is back. 8.2% right now uh, with CPI, 8.8% with PPI. Now, the issue is, if you calculated inflation today like they did back in the 70s and 80s, by most calculations, CPI would be running at around 11 12%. And I talked about that last year on how they calculate housing costs, shelter costs, through something called OER, owner's equivalent rent. I'm not going to dig into that today, because I talked about it last year but it's a lag and will keep inflation grinding higher even though housing values are starting to decline. But we have a massive inflation problem. Now let's talk about the order of inflation. How does inflation move through an economy? Well, when the Fed sends all this wave of money and the federal government sends this big wave of money through the economy, think of money moving like water on a river. It moves to the easiest path first. So the first thing it does is hit its asset values. Because all of a sudden, the banks that are flooded with money, or the insurance companies, or pension plants, or the capital markets, when the Fed buys securities off of them and sends money back, what do they do? They invest in the stock market. They buy bonds. 
They invest in real estate. They start lending. It pumps up asset values. That's the first thing that happened. Remember, everybody would sit around back when the lockdowns were happening. The economy was uh, in a dive. Corporate profits were in a dive. And the stock market was going straight up. And people were going, what the heck is going on? because there was a wave of money and it had to go somewhere. So then once money gets in the system, then it starts hitting the price of goods. People are getting their stimulus checks. Their stocks are going up. Well, I'm feeling pretty wealthy. Oh, let's buy a Peloton. Let's buy workout, uh, home workout stuff. Let's fix up the home. Let's buy furniture. Let's go buy a new car. So the price of goods start to move. And then as the price of goods start to move, then it starts seeping into the price of services. Then it starts going into the price of an airfare, price of health care, price of all kinds of services, accounting fees, whatever. And then lastly, it sinks into the price of wages. And wages start grinding up. Now, this is the Fed's biggest fear. It's called the wage price spiral. And what is that? Inflation takes off, higher prices of consumer goods, higher demand of wages. Employees go, I'm getting buried. The cost of everything's going up. Gasoline, groceries, rent, I need a raise. So it goes to the company and says, hey, I need a big raise because I can't keep up. So the company gives them a raise, and then all of a sudden the company says, oh, we've got to pass that raise on because we want to keep our profit margins. So they increase the price of their goods, which increases inflation, increases inflation expectations. Then the demand for wages go up, and you get in this ever-lifting cycle. It's called the wage price spiral. And that is what the Fed is trying to halt because it's very hard to rip inflation out of wages. In Germany, they do it a little bit different. When they go into recession, everybody takes, nobody gets laid off, everybody takes like a 20% reduction of salaries. Here, we lay people off. But it's very hard to go to somebody and say, hey, you know, we just gave you a $10,000 raise, we're gonna take that back from you. So wage inflation is very sticky. And this is what the Fed is worried about. And you know, wages have increased 5.2% uh, this past year. So big wage growth. Problem is, the American consumer is still underwater. Why? Because inflation's running at over 8%. So 8% minus 5%, they're down 3%. Now, last year, I said this was the most important graph that I was going to show you. I made a whole series of arguments for why Inflation was transitory to try to make that argument, supply chain disruption, labor constraints, all the rest. But I also made the argument why I felt inflation was structural. And I said, this graph explains my view because I'm a monetarist. What does a monetarist mean? I believe in what Milton Friedman said. Inflation is always a monetary phenomenon. You print too much dollars, chasing the same amount of goods, prices are going to go up. And that's what we did. We increased our money supply at a faster rate than any time in our country's history. The Federal Reserve increased the M2 money supply by 39% over two years. Now the Fed is slowing the money supply growth and it's going to end up being negative to wring out inflation. Well, the party costs more than imagined. To combat inflation, what is the Fed doing now? They're hiking interest rates. And they just did another 75 basis points yesterday. So, boom, interest rates are on the move. That's the overnight rate. These are midterm rates two year, three, five year, seven year, and 10 year. And then lastly, mortgage rates. Now we have a mortgage rate uh, somewhere around seven and a quarter today, more than doubled. Let's take a look at how much they've increased. So the Fed has taken up uh, rates now, the overnight rate, by 375 basis points. 
So think of it, the Fed funds rate last year at this time was eight basis points. Now it's 3.75, that's a 4,500% increase. Two-year treasury, 822% increase. The five-year, 258. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but mortgage rates up 136%. These are major movements, percentage movements, like we've never seen before. The Fed's also doing something else. Now let's do the refresher course on quantitative easing and what they're now switching to called quantitative tightening. So what is quantitative easing? Money printing, a lot of different words, but how does it work? What the Federal Reserve does is they go into the banking industry, into the pension industry, into the capital markets insurance companies and buy treasuries and mortgage-backed securities off their balance sheet, puts them on the Fed's balance sheet, and sends back cash. And again, what do the, all these institutions do with that cash? They don't sit on it and just earn nothing. They invest in the equity markets, they start lending it, they start buying bonds, and that money moves through the system. Well, what is quantitative tightening? It's just the opposite side of the coin. Instead, the Fed sells mortgage backs or treasuries or just lets them roll off and sucks cash back off the balance sheets of these companies, which will drive down asset values. I will say to you, well, rising interest rates have a bigger impact in the real economy. The Fed's balance sheet and quantitative easing or quantitative tightening has an equal, if not bigger, impact to asset values. So if you're watching what's going on with your equities or real estate or whatever, you got to stay focused on what the Fed's doing with their balance sheet. That's why you hear all the people on CNBC and all that, or Bloomberg, always talking. What is the Fed doing? Is the Fed going to pivot and all the rest? Because it has such an influence on asset values. And now we can see what's happening with the Fed's balance sheet. You see at the very end, that red and that blue are starting to dip down. So what the Fed did is in May, they said they'd start shrinking their balance sheet by 47.5 billion through the summer months, and then start increasing the shrinkage of their balance sheet by $95 billion a month. And so if they continued that through the rest of the year, they'd suck $523 billion out of the system this year, and they'd suck another 1.1 trillion out next year, taking money out of the system. Well, it was the party that broke the casino. Now, some people asked me last year, why did you call you know, the stock market and the capital markets a casino? Because literally, for a couple year period of time, that's what it behaved like. The allocation of capital being done properly where people were looking at balance sheets, income statements, cash flows, understanding the products, is the product working? What are happening with profit margins? Nobody cared about that. All people did was chase return. In fact, the companies would lose more money, drove stocks even higher. It was insanity. In fact, one of my big complaints about what the Fed did is you can't throw that much money into the system, not only not create inflation, but misallocate capital in a horrific way, which is exactly what we did as a country. We just torched a lot of money. So what has happened? All the US equity market indices uh, have sold off. S&P is the gray line at the bottom. That's off 21.5% for the year. The Dow was down 20 some odd percent, but this last month has had a big uh, bounce back up and the Dow is the red line. You can see that at the end. And then the, Na uh, the NASDAQ is down 33.5 because that's where a lot of the technology and the companies that were just burning money uh, rested. Interesting. Here are the top performing sectors. Energy for a second year in the row. Best performer. At the, at the bottom, communication services, consumer discretionary, real estate. Obviously, uh, technology has been hit and it falls in a number of those different buckets. Actually, let me back up there for a second. This is one important thing for all of you, for me to express and share. 
When equity markets go up, they tend to go on a stair-step pattern, pause, maybe a little sell-off, grind up. It's a smoother process on the upside. When equity markets go down, they go down in a big jagged sawtooth pattern. They fall off a cliff, then they get a big bounce, bear market rally, then they fall down, they get a big uh, bounce, and they just keep heading lower, but it's very jagged. So be careful of thinking, oh, things are all back, because quite often at that point, boom, they collapse again, kind of like what happened this summer. We had this big bear market rally, and then boom, got swooshed uh, back down. Now, the biggest bubbles have burst. AMC stock, a company whose business model has been destroyed by online streaming. They destroyed their balance, lost so much money. COVID lockdowns killed them as well. That stock's down 89%. How about the ARK Innovation ETF, the hottest ETF, Kathy Woods. I invest in companies that don't even make money. I'm so leading edge. Yeah, well, you got smoked and all your investors got smoked. <laughs> Emerging Cloud Index, oh, that's the hottest thing because everybody's working from home. Okay, you know, there's some real companies there, but that's gotten ho smoked. And then SPAC, Special Purpose Acquisition Corporations. I mean, the insanity of this, of the hundreds of hundreds of SPACs, Give money to a sponsor that you don't know what they're going to go buy. You're just giving them a blank check to go buy something. And by the way, they'll make money even if you lose money. Didn't work out very well for most investors in SPAC, down 79%. Crypto. Now, I know this is a contentious one. Some are big crypto bulls. But the crypto market. Uh, Peaked out at a $3 trillion valuation, has lost $2 trillion, so down 67%. Uh, and, you know, so many of the other cryptos are, are, have just been obliterated. But, you know, my favorite one is Dogecoin. You know, the guy created it as a joke. It had a market cap of one point of $45 billion as a joke. Uh, and I talked to you about how many cryptos got created last year. I think they, uh, last year it was up to 12,000 cryptos. This year it's up to 22,000 cryptocurrencies. Yes, 22,000 cryptocurrencies. But why not? If some guy created a joke and made a fortune off of it, why don't I create one and maybe try to hype people into buying that? So the point is cryptos had a very bad year and probably I think will continue as the Fed drains money. And for all the people that said, oh, crypto is a great hedge against inflation, well, how has it worked against inflation? We're, here we're having the biggest inflation, and the cryptos are down 67%. Now, a lot of people ask me, Eric, do you think now is the time to enter the equity markets? It's had a sell-off. It's, you know, is now the time to get in? I warn you all, and I'm going to show you two reasons why right here. If you look at the first graph, S&P 500 profit margins, what do you see? Profit margins skyrocketed to all-time highs because all of a sudden inflation came in the system. When inflation first comes in and hits the price of goods, companies all of a sudden get all these demands, so they raise their prices up. The cost hasn't caught up, so all of a sudden profit margins just bloom for companies. That's exactly what happened. Usually profit margins run four, five, six, seven percent. We got profit margins up over 12 percent. Right now they're at 11.7. So a lot of people say, well, the S&P 500 forward earnings is at 17.4, a little higher than historical norm. But if profit margins fall by 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, well, what, what is this trading at? It's up in the mid to high 20s. And by the way, why are you putting a high P.E. multiple on declining forward earnings? So the big problem that I see with the equity markets today is we're going to see a, a big retrenchment in corporate earnings over the next six, nine months as costs continue to grind higher and pricing power continues to decline. And therefore, I think we have more downside. I'll show you this really quickly, too. This is the Buffett indicator. <clears throat> this is way uh, Warren Buffett determines whether the equity markets are overvalued or undervalued. The red line is GDP. And his basic theory is the total market capitalization of all stocks should largely track where GDP is. 
If it's under that, then uh, the stock market is undervalued. If the market capitalization is above GDP, then it's overvalued. Well, look at the moonshot that we ended up having and how overvalued it is still compared to GDP even after the sell-off. Now let's talk about another area that has been absolutely crushed, and that is the fixed income markets. This is a graph of the Treasury market. The US Treasury market has had its worst performance since 1788. Let that one sink in. Now, when you took rates to zero and then you start taking them up, again, think of those percentage changes. The fixed income market is bigger and more important than even the equity markets. Total fixed income market is 53.7 trillion. Now, I don't think this year had the Treasury market is going to be anywhere near as bad as what we went through because I think we're slowly coming to the end of rate rises. But here's my one big word of caution. Treasuries are the risk-free asset. Corporate debt, high-yield debt, securitization debt, consumer debt has something called a credit spread ba baked in. And we haven't yet seen credit spreads blow out. That will start coming this year because corporate defaults, bankruptcies, consumer defaults that will flow in through the securitization market, be it auto, home, whatever it may be. So I think the losses in the treasury market are coming to an end, maybe still a bit more, but beware of your holdings if you have a lot of exposure to corporate debt, particularly high yield, or the whole loan or the securitization market, the CLO market. Most individuals don't, but some do. And most, but a lot of you have that, and you don't even know because it may be in, in a pension fund or your 401k plans. All right, reality is kicked in and it's time to get back to work. Well, not only do we have to get back to work to pay all this debt, but a lot of people were sitting at home for two and a half years uh, pretending to work. Not to say that there aren't a lot of hardworking people from home, but. Uh, so where are we with our GDP? Well, we had a, you know, we had a lot of robust GDP growth last year, uh, printed 7% in the fourth quarter, and then Boom, things really dropped off. And we ended up having two quarters of contraction. Uh, first quarter GDP print was a negative 1.6, second quarter 0.6. Uh, you know, two quarters of uh, contraction is the definition of a recession. So we had a very mild recession. Now we pop back up at 2.6. I don't get too caught up in one quarter to the next because things can get pulled forward, pushed back. Uh, I think you will see that probably fourth quarter will start trending back down. I don't know if it will be a, a contracted number, but I think it will be weaker than third quarter. Uh, and you can see this by looking at the US ISM Manufacturing PMI Index. This tracks uh, the health of the manufacturing sector. The lower one tracks the health of the service sector. 50 is the important line on this graph, folks. Anything above 50 means expansion. Anything below 50 means contraction. As you can see, uh, coming out of COVID, this nice big growth in manufacturing, now it's headed down and it's, it's just above uh, contraction, the neutral point. ISM, still in expansion, but again, coming off. Retail sales. Obviously, with all that money being printed, well, first they collapsed when everything was shut down, then all that money printed, and retail sales have been off the charts the last two and a half years, and now they're kind of settling in. What is happening is there's been a big shift in where people are spending money. Instead of buying home workout equipment or furniture or cars or Peloton bikes, people are now out in restaurants, concerts, gyms, traveling. The other thing that's happening to the consumer is they're having to allocate more and more money to basic necessities, particularly people at the lower economic spectrum. 
where they have to allocate a lot of their resources to gasoline and groceries. Now here's the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate has returned to his historic lows that we reached right before uh, COVID hit. Um, and, you know, very strong. We've had a big problem with people or companies trying to find employees. So that's driven really strong employment. Now I will tell you, and this is important, and look at this graph intently. Unemployment rate is one, probably the biggest lagging indicator of where an economy is going to go. It tends to reach its lowest point right before we go into recession. It doesn't start moving up until you get into the middle of a recession, as you can see here. Dropped and then starts moving and then peaks out kind of even after the recession has ended. There's the one in the 1980s. You can look at any one of these. Because the first thing when profits are going down and sales are collapsing and all the rest, it's not like the, the CEO walks in, okay, we gotta fire everybody. No, that's the last action they make. So employment is always a lagging indicator when you're looking at the unemployment rate. There's forward indicators in, uh, uh, in the employment sector, but the unemployment rate is not it. But there is something unhealthy in our labor markets, and that is the labor force participation rate. That's how many people are participating in our labor force. As you see, we came from the 1960s and started having this big boom up because that, that was the time in the 70s and 80s when women entered the labor markets. And then it peaked in 2000 and has been st steadily kind of going down and then really took a hit after COVID and still hasn't rebounded. The biggest reason for this is working age males, believe it or not. Yes, you have retirees of the baby boom generation, all the rest, but working age males. If you looked at a graph, females have remained steady, consistently rising. Males have been declining. There's been a lot of studies on that. And what they've concluded is, sadly, Drug abuse, alcoholism, mental health issues not addressed, a whole series of things. I mean, think of when you go up to LA and you look at the homeless camps and you look at the people, most of them are males and most of them are of working age, 25 to 55 years old. So it's very sad that that has occurred. The other dynamic studies have shown government welfare system that has encouraged a lot of people not to work between, you know, uh, all forms of assistance, housing assistance, food stamp assistance, name it, a lot of people don't have to work. So um, it's a troubling trend, and I think that's one of the reasons why the unemployment rate will stay a bit lower and employment a bit stronger even in the next recession, because it's hard for employers to find quality people. All right, let's talk about the real estate markets. Well, Housing values skyrocketed during COVID. Millennials coming of age, getting married, having children, people not wanting to live in a 800 or 1,000 square foot apartment being locked in, wanted space, wanted territory. But the biggest reason, uber low interest rates. So housing values just exploded and took off. And now they started their decline. And you're seeing this with housing transaction volume is collapsing. Now folks, the first thing that happens when real estate pricing starts to change and move down is you get the classic Mexican standoff. Sellers still want to get the price of their home or their building from where it was a month or three months or six months ago. Buyers are saying, I can't afford that or that's overvalued, or financing costs have risen too much, so you get no transaction activity. And then what happens? Eventually the weak seller breaks. It could be they lose a job, they have to get relocated, a divorce, whatever the issue. So they break, they meet the lower bid. And then more of that happens and it breaks and they meet the lower bid. And slowly but surely you get the grind down in values. But the first thing you see 
is a collapse in transaction vo volumes, and that's exactly what has happened in the housing market. And this explains it all. If you took a medium Fannie Freddie securitized mortgage of 428,000, a year ago, you would have gotten an interest rate of 2.98%. Your monthly payment would have been $1,803. Today, that same mortgage amount, 30-year fixed, at a 7.25 interest rate, your monthly payment is $2,924. That's over a 60% increase in your monthly payment. Now think of this, a lot of people, particularly entry-level buyers, when they buy a home, they say, I can buy only up to this amount of a monthly payment. Well, if you kept that monthly payment, if somebody said, I only can pay $1,800 using the current mortgage rate, that means the amount of mortgage they could get is 264,000. That's a 38% decline. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think housing values are gonna go down 38%, but folks, it's just math. And remember, homes are heavily financed, so financing costs matters immensely to home values. And here's mortgage activity. As you can see, it is just collapsed. A lot of people, we're gonna have low activity in the uh, residential and the housing market for a long time because a lot of people are trapped in low fixed rate mortgages. Good for them, they got a real cheap mortgage, but it's gonna, they're gonna be in that home for a long time. Now, here's one of the two reasons I don't think we're gonna have the housing collapse that we had during the Great Financial Recession. The first reason is, back then, the whole market was financed on exceptionally shaky ground. Remember the interest-only IO mortgage? Or how about the payment option mortgage, where I don't have to make a payment, it'll just get added to my mortgage balance. Or how about the no-doc or low-doc loan, where somebody could just fraudulently say, oh, I, I make you know, $20,000 a month, and they make $2,000 a month, they're buying homes. Fortunately, that's not around. That is what sent the cratering, that whole subprime crap mortgage product, uh, products cratered the market. But there was another issue also happening. Household formation. How many new households get formed in America every year is about 1.2 to 1.3 million. Some years it can go much lower. If we're in a bad recession, kids move back in with their parents or their elderly parents move in with their kids. Couples can't get divorced or divorced live in the same home and in boom times, it can go higher. But it's usually about 1.2, 1.3. We were overbuilding homes for multiple years before the housing bubble popped, so we had excess supply. Because of the collapse and the losses and the, that home builders and wiped out many of them and banks took, we went for almost a decade of undersupplying housing up until the last few years. Therefore, we still need more housing units. I think housing values are gonna come down, but they're not gonna collapse like they did last time. All right, rents. Rent skyrocketed. If any of you are multifamily owners, I own a bunch of multifamily in my development company in Wisconsin, and man, it has been a boom time. Uh, people couldn't get homes, housing values were getting out of control for a lot of young people. And apartment owners started seeing inflation and going, hey, we can price up our rents, and boom, rents took off, up 26%. Now what's happening? The month over month, year over year, or year over year change is coming down and continuing to come down. And if you look at the month over month numbers, in some markets, it's actually even started to reverse course uh, and go negative. But great last two, three years for, uh, Apartment owners, not good for renters. Now commercial real estate transactions. I know many of you out here are big investors in commercial real estate in some way, shape, and form. Well, you can starting to see transaction volumes declining here, and if you look into fourth quarter, early fourth quarter numbers, they're continuing to get worse, and I think what you're gonna see is the same 
trend line that you're seeing in housing by the time you get to uh, early next year. Again, the Mexican standoff. Here's what's happened to cap rates. Cap rates, which is just a yield, you know, what kind of yield I get. Yields just kept getting lower. Cap rates kept getting lower. Now, some of you are going, the gray line is uh, multifamily, the dark line's industrial, and the light blue line's retail, and the red line is office. Office never got that low because the problem's in office and work from home. But some of you are saying, heck, what are you talking about? Cap rates in Southern California for industrial? Low threes. I even sold a property in the high twos. This is the whole country. So Dubuque, Iowa, to Biloxi, Mississippi, small transactions. Point is, cap rates got exceptionally low because of interest rates, and now they're starting to shift course. And you can also see that in the CBRE study. Now here's probably the biggest predictor for what's going to happen with commercial real estate. This is REIT valuations, REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust, big holders, big buyers of real estate, of all kinds of commercial real estate. The equity markets price things a lot quicker. In the real estate markets, you need thousands and thousands of transactions, and slowly they move up and slowly they move down, and getting that data is delayed. In the equity markets, things reprice every day, and you can see the repricing happen overnight. So REIT values have sold off by 32%. Remember, real estate sector was the th uh, third worst sector uh, this year in the equity markets. Why does that matter? Because REITs aren't just an indicator, they're a predictor of what's gonna come. If their cost of equity capital goes up, their ability to pay a high price for your property goes down. So you always have to, if you're a commercial real estate investor, you always have to know what's going on with REIT values if you're looking to sell your property at some point. If you're holding it for the long term, who cares? But you always got to keep your eyes on what's happening with REIT values. All right, now here's the big issue that I think is going to be problematic for the commercial real estate market over the next several years and going to put a lot of strain but also gonna be a lot of opportunity for those of you who have cash and have been conservative. And I call it the CMBS wall of maturities. This is the data I can get because I can get CMBS commercial mortgage-backed securities. I can't pull that data for the banking industry and the insurance industry. The point is we're gonna have a wall of maturities that are all these loans are gonna to have to get refinanced at much higher rates. Because if you look at where rates were in 2012 or at any point in time over the last 10 years, because what are most commercial mortgages done on? Either a five or 10 year term. And as these mortgages come to term, if those assets haven't paid down, all of a sudden your financing costs go up, that changes your debt service coverage ratio, it changes your loan to value ratio, it changes your debt yield, and a lot of property owners are gonna to have to put money into those properties to resize the loan. Or they're gonna go through a restructuring, foreclosure, and the property's gonna be taken from them. You're gonna have a wave of foreclosures coming in the commercial property market if rates stay up here for the next two, three years. Now again, Great opportunity for people that are sitting on a lot of money and been wanting to deploy it in commercial real estate. There's going to be a great buying opportunity coming. But I think that's going to take a couple years if this wall of maturities works its way through the system. I'm going to leave you with one last quote. It's a quote by somebody very important to me, uh, no longer with me. Uh, that's my father. He was the president of the National Association of Realtors, undersecretary of HUD under President Reagan. He was a real estate investor his whole life, to say the least. He knew something about finance and real estate and authorized the creation of the first mortgage-backed security. He had a great line, real estate values float on a sea of finance, and it's the cost and availability of that finance that will determine value. Think of that for two seconds. First of all, real estate is heavily financed. And if the cost is going down, you can pay more. If the availability is plentiful and terms and conditions are favorable, you can pay more. 
Conversely, if the cost of finance is going up, like it is, and the availability is collapsing, which it is, Wells Fargo, out of the commercial real estate business, has gone to the sideline this summer, B of A followed suit, most of the big banks on the East Coast, Truist, you can run through the litany of them, have all pulled back, and terms and conditionings are tightening, so the ability to get finance is really drying up. So, in my view, real estate values are going down. All right, let's talk about the energy markets real quickly. Energy security and costs are key to a thriving economy. Well, politics is holding energy policy and investment captive. President Biden's very first action when he took president was canceling the Keystone Pipeline. Those poor investors put billions of dollars, worked on this project for 20 years, it was almost completed, and he just shut it down. If he wouldn't have done that, that would have been adding almost another million barrels of oil a day coming out of Canada, a friend of ours. ESG mandates, environmental social governance mandates have been depriving the oil and gas industry from critical investment to continue to drill and create more energy for this country. As a result, we've had an underinvestment has been occurring. Today, we are producing 11.8 million barrels. We were producing 13 million barrels uh, in, at the end of 2019. Now, you'd say, oh, that's only a million two barrels, but when you're using about 16 million barrels a day, that's a lot of oil. And that has a huge influence on the price of oil. I'm going to say this. I believe in green energy. I'm going to talk about solar in a second. But to think that we are going to move an economy this size, any economy, from its existing energy sources in a matter of a decade, you are smoking crack cocaine. <laughs> Seriously. We have never shifted from one energy to the next. We continue to use that, and then you start using the new energy in a bigger and bigger way. Even when we're you know, killing oils for, uh, whales for, oil, uh, for their fat as our first source of energy, they were still killing oils much later, even after petrol came around. Point is, it takes decades to, trans, uh, uh, to change an economy and how it uses and where the energy comes from. And by the way, we're abundant in natural gas. The re reason greenhouse gases have come down is because of natural gas. So, uh, yes, LNG, absolutely. And it's one of our biggest advantages. So I don't know why. Here's another riff I'm going to, I'm sorry to go on. But if you're an environmentalist and you believe whatever happens in the globe hits the global environment, why wouldn't you want to drill in America or in Western Europe where we have strict environmental standards and if somebody messes up an oil company, they have to fix it versus going asking Venezuela to, to print or produce more oil or Iran or wherever else where they have no environmental standards? It makes no sense at all. And by the way, the most efficient way to use less energy is to create pipelines for energy instead of moving it on rail and trucks. So off my riff, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So here's what's happened to uh, oil and natural gas prices. I've taken out the dip during COVID because energy prices collapsed. I started from right at the end of of, of uh, 2019 to where they are today. So as you can see, crude oil prices are up 48%. Diesel prices are up 80%. We have a big diesel problem. And by the way, most of our trucks still operate off of diesel. Nat gas prices up 185%. Gasoline prices up 55%. These are huge moves. Energy makes our whole economy operate. Energy security is so critical for us. Now let me go off on another riff. And I don't mean to get political, but politics is causing gross negligence. This is our, the blue line is our strategic petroleum reserves. This was created in the 70s to protect our country in the event of a war, in the event of a natural disaster, a big earthquake here in California or a hurricane, where all of a sudden we don't have access to energy 
through our normal infrastructure. Therefore, in a crisis, our country had these strategic petroleum reserves to protect ourselves. What has President Biden done? He has been draining it purely for politics. He has drained 200 million barrels out of it to try to hold down gas prices to help his pet party in a midterm. It's a shame that the press hasn't hold him accountable for this. This is not something you play politics with, folks. Because if we all of a sudden get into a conflict with China or, or some natural disaster happens, we're going to be praying and hoping we have those strategic petroleum reserves. OK, thank you. <laughs> Now let's look at energy costs, electricity costs uh, throughout the country. This is a map of the US. Uh, the red is the highest, the, uh, the, the, the blue is the lowest uh, electricity cost. Surprise, surprise. Anybody surprised by this? California is the second highest in the country. The only one higher is Hawaii because they have to import every single, uh, all of their energy. So California energy rates have risen by 64.9% in the last decade. 23.9% in the last uh, uh, three years. Now think of that. This state is one of the most energy rich states. Oil, nat, gas, everything. We just don't use it. And everything's going to go electric. Well, how do you think, where do you get the electricity from? <laughs> it's not just a plug in a wall. It comes from a coal, nat, gas. Yes, you can use solar, which I'm a big proponent of wind. But those are higher costs to produce energy. Hopefully, we get it lower. And I'm a big believer we continue to invest in that. But folks, this is insanity. This state should not be having the high, second highest energy electricity rates, given how energy rich we are. Now, I told you last year, if you haven't looked at solar for your business or your buildings, you're making a grave mistake. With what they've passed, they've only made the economics better. I'll make this real quick. A million dollar investment, you're going to basically get 50% of your money back in year one between tax credits and accelerated depreciation. Then, given the uh, return you're going to generate off of uh, savings on that remaining 50%, in most cases, when we're doing models for clients, because we provide financing, leasing, or will even own the solar system for those that don't want to, you're seeing uh, IRRs in the high teens, low to mid 20s. Tell me where out there today you can find those kind of IRRs. And by the way, the biggest thing is the eyes, these IRRs are probably going to be better. Why? Because if energy prices keep rising, then the savings are only going to be bigger. So if you are interested, we have these little signs around outside where there's a QR code. You can just go up, hit your phone, snap it. It'll take you to our solar team. They can follow up with you and talk to you about how to price solar and look at solar and what kind of returns you could generate. All right, there's nothing left in the piggy bank. Now we get dark, OK? The US national debt to GDP has surpassed World War II levels. We now have $31.2 trillion. Our debt to GDP is 122%. We know from economic studies, once a country gets more than 90 and certainly 100% of debt to GDP, they start struggling with being able to manage that level of debt. Why? Because growth rates slow down. The amount of resources have to go to service that debt grow and grow. Remember last year, I said there's only one of two options this country has because we're at the beginning of a debt trap. We're in the teeth of it. We can either default, which we can't, because if the US defaulted on its debt, it would send the whole globe into depression for decades. You would wipe out literally every financial entity around the globe most governments, most pension funds. So the only other option is to inflate. The problem is they don't want runaway inflation because then you start getting something called stagflation and you start breaking your economy apart like what was starting to happen in the 70s, but what really happened in countries where they get hyperinflation like Weimar Republic in Germany, like Argentina, and you can go through the litany of Latin American countries that this has happened to. 
Now, this also explains why we're in a debt trap. The circle. That's 2021 outlays by the federal government, $6.6 trillion. At the very top, you see the gray, net interest. That was the cost of paying our debt. Just the interest cost was $345 billion in 2001. Our interest costs actually went down, even though our debt was going up. Why? Because rates went to zero. The Federal Reserve was financing things at almost no cost. The problem now, as rates start to rise this year, our interest cost now in 2022 is $534 billion. And if we go to up another 200 basis points, which we already have, this year, in 2023, it could be $992 billion, almost a trillion dollars. If it goes higher, it could be a trillion too. Therefore, you go back to this, it will be bigger than anything other than Social Security. Just the cost of paying on our debt will squeeze out all other expenditures. That's why we're in a debt trap. Therefore, what is the Fed going to try to do? Forget about them getting back to 2% inflation rate. I don't think that's their goal. What they need is inflation running at around 4 or 5% consistently, where it's not blowing everything up, but it's consistently eroding the amount of debt. Because how do you get rid of debt? You inflate your way out of it. The problem is you have to walk a tightrope. Because if they shove too much money into the system, inflation takes off again. If they take money out of the system, what's happening? Asset values are going down. Tax revenue goes down. The US government's going to receive a lot less money. California, I can guarantee you, will be back in financial problems. Uh, in a year or so, because California has benefited from all these capital gains from the tech industry, which is drying up now that all the losses that are coming. So this is the heart of why I say we're in a debt trap. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't, and you have to walk this perfect tightrope. I think we're going to live through the next decade of swings of inflation uh, and swings of deflation and hope we can all navigate through it. Now, I, I thought this would be interesting just to show everybody. If the US government was a family of three, we had already gone bankrupt. <laughs> so the medium US family of three people makes $45,986, basically $46,000. If a family spent like the federal government, it would be spending 58, call it 59,000 which means they would have put another $13,000 on their credit cards after already racking up almost $300,000 in credit card debt. To say the least, they would have gone bankrupt, you know, five, six, seven, ten years ago. That's where we are as a federal government. All right, let's go take a real quick look at the global economies and then let's wrap it up. For as bad a problems we are in, <laughs> the world's worst. <laughs> Europe is a train wreck. Uh, look, Europe's growth rates have been low for a long, long time. One, excessive regulation, enti excessive entitlement programs, a population growth that's a uh, population that's barely growing. Uh, they're not in recession yet, but they're quickly heading into a very severe recession. You can see that their uh, manufacturing index is already dipped negative. Their service index is dipped negative. Uh, but when we talk about inflation, their inflation problem's a lot worse than ours. It's skyrocketing. Why? They have two issues. One, they're, they rely on oil and gas largely from Russia. So the war has crimped the amount of energy they can get, and they're short energy in a very material way. The second reason is the fall of the euro against the dollar. We are exporting our inflation to them. So their inflation pressures are building because of what's happening, the euro against the dollar. Here's a look at energy prices, as you can see. You know, we complain, I was complaining about California. Well, if you're in Germany, your, your, your electricity costs are almost double of what they are here. They have a very serious problem, and I don't mean to make light of it. They're worried that a lot of people may die this winter if the winter gets bad. People literally freeze to death because they won't be able to heat their homes. The cost for the average consumer in Europe 
be it in England or Germany or most of these countries, France is the best position because they still rely on nuclear. But it is so severe, and it's really going to put their economy into a very severe recession. Now let's talk real quickly about China. China's D GDP, I don't even like spending time talking about it because none of their data is honest. They, they tell you whatever they want, but clearly China had been slowing down. Uh, they just put up a, a print of 3.9%. I don't buy it. They have their, these rolling COVID lockdowns on most of their big cities. But the big problem going on in China is what I mentioned last year, which had started uh, it just started shortly before our economic forum last year. They have a property bubble absolutely imploding. The magnitude of their property bubble may be as big or bigger than even the one that Japan built uh, throughout the 80s and early 90s. 20% of all their urban housing units are vacant, 65 million units. They not only built whole buildings that were empty, they built whole cities that were empty. They would build whole shopping malls where nobody was there. Why did they do that? Because they were trying to keep their population employed. But the big problem with this is property bubbles when they break are very hard to fix and take a long time. And it's the same problem Japan had and somewhat what we had when our housing bubble bust, which was nothing to near the magnitude of theirs, and that is it took down a lot of our financial institutions. This is Chinese banking assets since 2008. They have risen sixfold. The biggest banks in the world are now Chinese banks, even though they don't have the biggest economy. And where is all that finance of all that housing bubble? sitting on these banks' balance sheets. I think you're going to look back in five, 10 years, and China is going to go, be going through the same thing Japan did. Once their bubble burst in 92, they went through literally 20 years where their banking so sector was underwater, dysfunctional, very hard on their overall economy, and could barely get economic growth. And frankly, Japan is still a, a mess. For another reason that China is, China has the fastest aging population in the world. So when you take all these excess housing units and all this finance, and now the population is aging fast, you're going to create an upside down pyramid where a bunch of young people are supporting the elderly. And that is what is happening in China. So I'm very concerned about China in a lot of ways, but they have deep structural problems that are going to caused them a whole host of hurt over the next decade plus. So how bad will this hangover be? You got to love that. I mean, let's face it. That is one of the funniest movies of all time, The Hangover. <laughs> well, let's deal with one issue. The USD, the US dollar, is a wrecking ball for the world. What do I mean by it's a wrecking ball for the world? Two issues. Most major commodities, oil being the primary one, are all traded in dollars. So if you want to buy oil, you convert your euros, your yen, your whatever, into dollars to buy oil. Well, if your currency is collapsing, you have to spend more of your currency to get dollars to buy oil. So as I said, we are exporting inflation. That is what Jay Powell is doing. He's suppressing our inflation by a rising dollar and exporting inflation. The other problem is most countries, not ones in the euro, the yen, they issue most debt in their own currency, but most countries around the world issue debt in dollars. And many, many corporations, foreign corporations, issue debt in dollars. So if they operate in their own currency, but they issued their debt in dollars, and now their currency falls, that just means they have much more debt to carry. So the US dollar is just being a wrecking ball to the rest of the global economy. I think Europe will be in a severe recession. I think China will have a bounce after they release from the lockdowns slowly fade. Japan's in trouble. 
pretty much every place else in the world. And we live in a global economy. Next, the yield curve has inverted. It's probably the best predictor whether we're going into a recession or not. What is the yield curve? That is measuring the yield on a two-year treasury to the 10-year. Usually, you want an upsloping yield curve. That means you want 10-year treasury yields higher than two years because you're having more duration. When it inverts, it's a, put it this way, every time we have gone into recession, the yield curve has inverted. Not every time the yield curve is inverted and we've gone in recession, there's a couple cases that happened briefly and didn't, but every time we've gone into recession, it has inverted. Why? Because all the fixed income investors, smart investors, they know if we go into recession, rates are gonna eventually come down, so they wanna go buy as long dated bond as possible to make as much money when rates come down. Plus, if the yield curve's upside down, banks don't wanna lend into it because their funding costs are higher than what they can borrow out on the curve. So this is not signaling a good signal for the economy coming ahead. Money supply is now collapsing. I talked about money supply growth and inflation. Now it's collapsing. And if you inflation adjust this, money supply growth is negative. It's a very important graph. I saw somebody just took a snapshot. Please feel free and we'll send this out to you. But a hugely important graph. And as you can see, before every gray line, money supply collapse. And again, the gray lines are the recession periods. Just like if I go back to the uh, inverted yield curve, before every gray line, the yield curve inverts, 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 inverts. Well, it's inverted. Negative wealth effect. When the Fed wants to pump up economy, it wants asset values to rise to create a positive wealth effect because people feel wealthier. Hey, I've made a lot of money in the stock market. My bonds are doing well. My real estate's doing well. I'm gonna go spend money, take that trip. I'm gonna go buy a new car. I'm gonna go buy whatever, a new home. Well, right now we have the exact opposite going on. In fact, one of the biggest negative wealth effects we've ever seen. We've lost $18 trillion in the US between our equity markets and our fixed income markets. That's a big negative wealth effect. And now lastly, what will the Fed break? Almost every time the Fed starts raising rates, they break something. So if you look uh, back in uh, 1970, cranking rates, Penn Central, one of the biggest railroads. 1974, Franklin National Bank, one of the biggest banks back then. Uh, in in 19, uh, early 80s, broke all of Latin America. Again, why? Because they issued debt in dollars. And with interest rates skyrocketing, the dollar shooting up because the currencies follow rates, cratered all of Latin America. That took them 30 years to work through. How about the stock market crash in 87? Or the SNL crisis, which really has its roots back to the early 80s, but then finally uh, gave in in 88 through 92. And then how about 94, Mexico? And I threw in Orange County. Remember Orange County went bankrupt. Uh, then you had the tech bubble in 2001. And then obviously the great financial recession, the housing bust, the collapse of Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns. Every time the Fed goes on a big rate hike, they're gonna break something. And in fact, the whole pension system in England was under severe strain and their central bank had to step in to help solve that problem recently. So my guess is at some point in the next six months, it could be a large series of large pension funds, investment fund, big financial entity, Credit Suisse is having big problems right now, or a couple foreign governments that hit crisis mode. Then we got black swan event. And this is a very serious black swan event. This is a quote by General Secretary Xi from China that he just delivered at his uh, speech of the Chinese Communist Party, the opening speech of their National Congress. 
We will continue to strive for peaceful reunification with the greatest sincerity and utmost effort. But we will never promise to renounce the use of force and we reserve the option of taking all necess measures necessary. And he's referring to the integration of Taiwan back with China. He has also said a couple years ago, he will not leave it to his successor to bring about the reunification. I think we should listen very seriously to him, like we should have listened to Vladimir Putin, who said, don't even think of bringing Ukraine into NATO. Parts of Ukraine belong to Russia. I mean, he was foretelling us exactly what we, he was going to do. Well, General Xi has been being very clear on what he plans to do. Now, if this event happens, oh, look out because inflation and scarcity of goods, do you realize 90% of our pharmaceuticals were being made in China? They're starting to get pulled back. Our chips, everything, Apple phones, you name it. Our supply chain so integrated with them, it's not even funny. So, and if you're gonna move, now's a pretty good time if you're him and that's your plans. When we have a weakened president, a weakened economy, uh, a war in, in Europe, this is a very serious black swan event that everybody should s s pay attention to. Now there's one other black swan event that is a real foreteller of negative things. Do the Philadelphia Phillies win the <laughs> World Series? <laughs> I mean, my wife's chilling, cheering for Philadelphia because her mom's from Philadelphia and she's from the East Coast. But I mean, when the Phillies won in 1929, the country went into a depression. In 1930, the depression got worse. In 1980, a horrible, horrible recession. And in 2008, the Great Recession. So God, let's hope Houston pulls it out. <laughs> it's on shaky ground, folks. It's on shaky ground. All right, so let's wrap up. Drum roll, my predictions for the year ahead. The goal of forecasting is not to predict the future, but to tell you what you need to know to take meaningful action in the present. So what are my predictions? The US economy will be in recession for most of 2023. There could be a quarter of positive growth during the year because consumers still balance sheets pretty good, but the US will largely be in contraction. Unemployment rate, it will rise and reach at least 5% by the end of the year. Job losses will impact white collar workers more than blue collar workers. We have a shortage of skilled labor, folks. We have a lot of people that have white collar skills and technology industry is gonna get hit. Interest rates. Uh, after the uh, rate move of yesterday, the Fed will move another short-term rates by another 50 to 100 basis points, and then probably pause. Could be 125 basis points, sure, but I think we're gonna pause out somewhere in that 75, 100 basis points for the rate move. I think they'll do probably 50 at their next meeting, and then wait to see and maybe do another 25 and then slow down, because I think the inflation data will start, uh, has already crested in a lot, of, a lot of areas. And again, as long as they keep up their balance sheet shrinkage. Once a crisis occurs and they break something, the Fed will start to cut rates, but it's too hard to determine the size of the rate cuts, which will depend on the severity of the crisis. That's just too unpredictable. The Fed's balance sheet, the Fed will have to halt quantitative tightening in the first half of the year due to dollar liquidity pressures both domestically and globally. Dollars are becoming harder to get by around the globe and we'll have problems in our funding markets around the globe. So I think they're gonna have to stop, my guess sometime March, April, May, uh, in that time frame, quantitative tightening. Predictions, Europe, it will fall into a severe recession with the risk of one of the pigs, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain, having a full-blown funding crisis. The ECB uh, has a big tour on their hand how to keep those countries alive as funding costs are rising. 
given their debt levels. China, when it rescinds their lockdown, it will cause a temporary economic boom in the Chinese economy, but also an inflationary spike, which will send global oil prices higher. One reason why oil prices aren't as high because China is using a lot less oil. And in fact, it's probably my biggest reason why I think they are doing these lockdowns. It has nothing to do with COVID. It's they know they will have a massive inflation problem and oil prices will skyrocket. Them. They import a lot more oil than us. China could start the whole globe into severe turmoil if it invades Taiwan. And I hate to say it, my odds are 50-50 on that. Man, I hope it's nowhere close to that. U.S. equity markets, major industries will contract by at least another 20% over the next six months due to downward earnings revisions and liquidity being drained from the markets. There will be at least a few bear market rallies during the year. And if or when the Fed pivots, there could be a larger rally that bring the markets back to where we are today. So I think we're going this. And if there's a big pivot, then I think you could have a big rally that sends us back. How long that rally lasts and how long it stays up, you know, we'll talk about next year. U.S. housing prices will fall 10% in 2022, will decline by another 10 to 15% in 23. Transa transaction volumes will stay depressed because many homeowners will be locked into their homes due to low fixed rate mortgages. Commercial real estate. Cap rates will continue to rise through 2023. CRE property values will fall by 15 to 30% depending on the property sector and geography. Different sectors will have bigger hits. Uh, you've already seen the dispersion between industrial, multifamily, office, retail. Interesting enough, retail has been very resilient. It's, it's been looking good. Fixed income, corporate credit spreads, particularly high yield, will blow out as a result of defaults and credit losses materialize. The CMBS market and the CLO market will seize up at some point. Political predictions. In regards to the House of Representatives, the Republicans will take back control of the House and win 25 plus seats. The only reason why they won't win more is because they actually did much better the last time around, even though they lost the House, they didn't lose as many seats. But I think there's no question we're setting up for a red wave. The Senate, uh, I meant to change that to three seats. I was looking at the map yesterday when you're looking at now Bulldog uh, up in New Hampshire. Laxalt looks uh, very promising for Republicans in Nevada. Uh, uh, Masters in Arizona, now it's neck and neck. My home state, Ron Johnson, looks like he's gonna beat Mandela Barnes and keep his Senate seat. I, I was thinking it was probably, you know, gonna be very close, maybe, you know, a few months ago that the Republicans may pick up nothing or one seat, but now I think it's looking two more likely three seats. Uh, after uh, the midterms, the Republicans will begin a series of investigations that will focus on Hunter Biden, uh, COVID lockdowns, and Anthony Fauci's funding of gain-of-function research of COVID. It's very clear uh, Rand Paul is going to be leading that. And in the House, uh, from the Senate perspective and from the House perspective, uh, Hunter Biden will be a central figure of his dealings and what was going on in Ukraine and all the rest, and China. And lastly, the presidential election, Democrats will start to pressure Biden to step aside and find a new presidential candidate. You already see Gavin Newsom setting himself up for it. Uh, yeah, 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 oh God, please. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thankfully, Thankfully, other parts of the country have a little more common sense. Uh, I, I don't mean to, I'm sorry, folks. Uh, Republicans will have at least three candidates uh, that will challenge former President Trump if he runs. Uh, my odds on are that President Trump does get back into it, but I think you'll have Mike Pompeo. I think it's looking very likely that Ron DeSantis will run. Nikki Haley seems like she will run. Larry Hogan, I think, will run from a more moderate midpoint. And if it is, if it is 
uh, Biden and uh, President Trump, I think you could see a third party candidate out of the middle, Republican, Democrat, come together and run against both of them. Folks, I don't think I'm gonna be anywhere near as accurate as I was last year. <laughs> It's just so hard to predict what's coming at us. It's, it's, we're, we're, we're living, as I said, interesting, crazy times. Thank you all for your attention. I know it's a lot of information. I hope you enjoyed this presentation.